I'm Ramon Alam. I'm a writer and contributing editor at the New Republic. And tonight is the final installment of our summer film festival. I am very happy tonight to be joined by Kyle Cheka. Kyle is the author of The Longing for Less, Living with Minimalism, and his criticism has been widely published, including in the New Republic. And our guest is Matt Prinzing. Matt is one of the directors of the 2007 documentary, The Gates. Uh, thank you guys for joining me. Um, take yourself off mute if you haven't. Um, before I get into our conversation about The Gates, I just want to offer a little bit of context. The Gates is a film that documents the celebrated conceptual artists Christo and Jean-Claude and their decades-long quest to create one of their large-scale temporary projects in New York City. That project is called The Gates. Christo and Jean-Claude dreamt it up in 1979, but it was finally realized in 2005. The Gates, if you were not in New York and lucky enough to see it in person, was an installation of more than 7,000 gates <laughs> along the pathways throughout Central Park. This existed from February 12th to February 27th of that year and then was removed. It lives on in this film, which I just found so delightful. I was saying to Matt before we started recording tonight, just that this movie was a much needed shot of joy for me. Mm -hmm. um, Matt, the Maisel's brothers, who were your co-directors on The Gates, documented previous projects by Christo and Jean-Claude. They made a film of Valley Curtain, which was an installation in which a curtain was suspended between two mountains in Colorado. Mm -hmm. um, they made a film of Running Fence, uh, which was one of the highlights of my undergraduate art history education, yeah. an extraordinary Beautiful. installation where you, and you get to see the artist running alongside the fence that plunges into the Pacific Ocean. It's really a beautiful project. They also documented his, their projects off the coast of Florida and in Paris. I wonder if you could begin by talking to us a little bit about the relationship between the Maisels and Christo and Jean-Claude. Sure. Um, David, Dave, just to be clear, David passed away in 87. I actually mm -hmm. never met him, but they started filming this back, back in 79, if not before then. Um, and at that time, uh, Albert and David were, uh, at the height of their filmmaking, uh, making uh, this direct cinema, cinema verite, with a few other people around the world, uh, where this movement was coming together. They weren't the only ones, but Christo was uh, drawn to them, and they were quite a dynamic foursome. But Christo just wanted someone to document whatever he was doing. And he made those two projects, um, the Valley Curtain and Running Fence. But then they were just filming, like he'd have, the German chancellor over to his apartment and they would show him all the projects uh, and we would just, they would just cut off, well, this is the film about the islands. We'll use that part of that for this. And mm -hmm. when they made the right, or they didn't make the Reichstag film, but that, some of that footage was there. So they're mm -hmm. all going on at once. And when the gate started, he was still, him and John claude were these immigrant artists who were in America, who had made these weird projects out in the middle of nowhere in, in America but they hadn't done anything in the big cities. They were just trying to do this big push all at once with Paris, Germany, um, this giant, or many projects, but New York City was one of them. And that's what we, we walk in on. Like they have these great expectations, but when they walk into that lawyer's office, they have uh, not a lot of credibility and he's mm -hmm. kind of dismissive. And that lawyer, one of the biggest lawyers in New York at that time, he was, big, he was the labor lawyer. He, was, he worked with LBJ, he was a big heavy hitter. And that's- that that particular scene was so striking because it reminded me so much of the depiction of Roy Cohn in Angels in America because <laughs> you go into this lawyer's 1979 office and he has these two phones ringing off the hook on his desk and he's sort of talking to Christo and Jean-Claude but also picking up the phone and these artists, these sort of, and Christo and Jean-Claude, Christo is Bulgarian, is that, I think that's right, and uh, Jean-Claude is French and they both kind of perform uh, foreignness. They both sort of act as though they don't really understand anything that's happening. And it's sort of remarkable to watch them performing their funny shtick of being, oh, we're just these like kooky European artists and this sort of grizzled New York lawyer who's like, you're never gonna build this crazy thing in Central Park, you know? Uh, they were very aware of it. They were so so competent at the same time, but they were just not afraid to ask the questions and see where mm -hmm. people would take them. I'm I'm struck by the fact. So, 
temp the, the temporary nature mm -hmm. of the installations that that Christian Jean Claude are known for is an essential part of the work, right? That the work exists for this particular moment in time and you either get to experience it or you don't. And they are merciless in, in their own way because they talk in the gates, toward the end of the gates, there are people in Central Park accosting them saying, leave it up for another week. And I understand that actually the city did ask them to keep the installation up, um, but they were very rigorous about that fact that it had to be temporary but what you're saying is that it they also felt an impetus to document it or to have these filmmakers on hand to capture it for absolutely for and during when the gates were up they uh, christo told us that they were he had been contacted by a uh, someone that wanted to buy a couple of the gates for some enormous amount of money and he turned him down like no the whole point is it has to go away but that's part of as he's selling the work you're buying these artworks that are depicting, and there's kind of a, there's a promise through the whole thing. But this, after the, that time, he didn't want to film anymore. Like, it's done, it's a happening. You were here or you weren't. It's all part of the value of it. It's not this banal thing that you can go to Disneyland. He's, he doesn't yeah. want to be that, yeah. he used to say. I like that tension between the like static drawings that are everywhere in the film and this like ephemeral experience. Because you see him, drawing and painting all the time. And mm -hmm. these are like the artifacts that fund the, the major work, though the major work just goes away. Yeah, and that's the one thing that changes because his art gets very realistic the further he gets along. But when he's walking around the park that first day, he just, he's, he's seeing for the first time, he's so excited. It's really, that was really fantastic to be around. Um, and it's also funny that this film, it's like a tale of two cities back in this, when he's really young and he's telling the people in the town board, like at the city, where, whatever that meeting was, I'm going to sell these paintings for like a couple thousand dollars. And the night before the gates, he's still there working. He was, he was selling these works for like a million dollars. Like the yeah. city had sh completely shifted and he had, he had shifted too. He was, he was on top of his game now. So one of the, one of the most interesting things about their practice is what Kyle was just talking about, which is the fact that these projects that were, extraordinarily complex and therefore quite expensive to execute were funded by the artists themselves. And I think one of the most striking things to me about what the Gates, the film documents is the misunderstanding between the powers in the city, the cultural and civic powers in the city and that particular arrangement. It's almost like they can't comprehend that these two kooky people could scrape together. In 1979, the price tag was $5 million. In 2005, it was actually 20 million. But it's, it's like they can't believe they're talking about that sum of money. And, and then it becomes almost like a moral question where it's like, well, how dare you spend $5 million on a temporary experience? Did, I'm wondering if you, I know you were behind the camera and not, but like, I'm wondering if you ever had a sense from from Christo or Jean-Claude about their, their particular savvy as sort of deal makers. Because essentially what they're doing is making a deal to realize this very idiosyncratic vision. And there's, a, there's a really telling part in it is when he's at the, the Met and he, he, he's, he gets very frantic and he's, he's like, I will never do anything that anyone tells me to do. Like I came from Bulgaria, I, I came in a boxcar, I got out of there. Like you can't, I'm doing this because I want to do it and the rest yeah. of it is what you do. But they would tell us stories of being, like when they were in Paris before they came to America and he was doing some much smaller works, um, wrapping storefronts and he had uh, barrels and alleyways and stuff. And he was wrapping things, but they would say, you know, money was always tight and their stories of them selling artwork out of the back of cars and parking garages and a broken down pickup truck. But the art of the deal, like every step of it, and that negotiation, you know, when he came to New York, he didn't go to anybody, he's like, who do we know? Who do we have to talk to to move the gear? And when he, uh, the next guy was uh, Gordon Davis. And when they tried to move his gear, they went to Dr. Clark. Dr. Clark was the guy that did the, the psychological studies in Brown versus Ed on the effects of, yeah. of uh, what was it, the effects of color on dolls or effects of kids <laughs> in the color of dolls. Yeah. And we're trying to really work Davis. Um, they were really, their way of making these deals, they were really good at it and they loved it. And they love, 
the argument. We made cuts in the beginning where we were really comfortable with them, and they, uh, we had pulled a lot of that out because some of it was really getting really aggressive, and, and they were, they'd sit up in the front eating popcorn and laughing, like, where's the argument? Bring back the argument. That's the art. That's what we're doing here. It was, they're very aware of it, and it was part of what they're doing. I, I find that incredibly charming because, like I said, I, there's a feeling of them performing oh, we're just artists. Oh, I don't even understand English really all that well. I don't really understand your answer, your complicated bureaucratic answer to my very straightforward question. And I just could sense that they were lying. And I sort of, <laughs> I, I feel like that's what you're saying. Like, because it takes a very particular kind of ego to be able to accomplish something on the scale that we're talking about. These are artists who manage to convince the government of Germany to let them right. cover the entire parliament building right. in fabric, right? These are, they're persuasive. They're not, uh, and in those early meetings, so we see them, we see footage. One of the things that's so striking to me about the film is that it doesn't labor to explain what it's doing. It simply drops you into the world of the film. So we, we meet the artists in 2005 as they're preparing for the gates. And then suddenly time shifts back and we're seeing these two artists at a much earlier point in their life in 1979 in a very different kind of New York, working on the same project. And, oh God, now I forgot my point, but like there's just something so remarkable. Oh, about what you said about what Christo is holding forth at the Metropolitan Museum in the press, in the press preview right before the yeah. exhibition opens, he declines to let the reporters say that this work is a gift to the city of New York, that it's not, it's not something he's doing to create a sense of joy, that he's doing it purely for selfish reasons, which is so remarkable. You very rarely hear an artist admit something like that. I was just watching footage of him talking about that last project he did in Italy, the Floating Piers, and mm -hmm. he's like, he's, it's so important to him that I did not do this for anyone but myself. I wanted this to exist and it's here. And, and he challenges you to like, do you have a problem with that? And it's, yeah. it's, so much of it is very aggressive and fascinating. It's like, I, yeah. I, I think it's okay, yeah. It's, it's funny how you see how the idea of art for art's sake makes people so angry and throughout the film, like, the bureaucrats can't understand it. The people can't understand it. They're like, what is this? This isn't marketing. This like isn't a social good. This is just a visual phenomenon. Like <laughs> that's still a really hard idea to accept. Like it, it has to mean something in the end, but to the artists, obviously it, it doesn't. It just has to exist as a, as a visual thing. Yeah, yeah. There's a scene to your point, Kyle, there's a scene where in the 1970s or maybe the eighties, we see Christo and Jean-Claude at a meeting of the New York Cultural Council. Yeah. Um, and there's like jazz band playing. It's like a scene from a from like an early 80s Woody Allen movie. It's really sort of the, <laughs> all these sort of like perfect New York types. And there's a man, I think probably either on the council or some other bureaucrat who's quite angry and says that he can't comprehend, like to him, the notion of giving over the park to these artists is an exercise in them building their brand effectively. Yeah. And, so, and so he sort of fundamentally reverses it because what Christo was saying is like, no, 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 we will, build, we will build the excitement for the project based on the art that I will sell. And that's what will pay for it. But this man seems to sort of invert the proposition. It's like, well, you'll do this thing and then your art will sell for more money, not realizing that that money all kind of vanishes in the production of the work itself. Yeah, I mean, it, but there's a little bit of truth in it. Like if you do a project in New York City, you're on the national stage again. And that, yeah. that like, there's a little truth to it. That guy, you know, there's always, well, he wasn't as, he comes across as being kind of like so angry and like he flies off the handle at, at him. But uh, there's a little truth to it. New York's like, well, someone's making the money. Why don't yeah. we get a cut of it? Why don't we get a cut of it? It's a public park. And at that time, you have to remember the city's broke. Yeah. The city, the, Central Park Conservancy didn't exist. The park was a dust bowl at that time. It was right about the time they filmed Hair too, I think, right? When it was all like, the grass was all mm -hmm. beaten yeah. up. And they ended up, <laughs> going through, they ended up, Christo paid for a uh, environmental protection document. It was this big document, multi, they did a huge study on what it would do to the park. And Gordon Davis rejected it. We go into it a little bit in the film, but what he really did is he took that, the city couldn't afford to pay for that maybe, but he took that 
and gathered interest in how to protect. These are the problems with the park that Christos are paid for to do that study. And that's, I'm oversimplifying it, but he used that as one of the things he did to start the conservancy. He's, he's the guy that moved that whole action forward. That's so interesting, yeah. Um, I should say that we will be taking questions, so feel free to drop them into the chat or the Q&A function below, and we'll get to them a little later on. Um, I'm so curious to hear, so Matt, you, I'm curious to know at what point you joined this project and um, <coughs> what, what the archival footage looked like to you when you first started sort of weeding, wading into uh, it. It was fantastic. So I was, I've been working with Albert for uh, five or six years and it was uh, me and my partner, uh, we're a filmmaking team, Antonio Ferrara. He was a cameraman, I did sound and edit, and he was also like a, a director and a cameraman. And we started working with Albert on a number of projects. And then Bloomberg just greenlit the project. It happened very quickly. And it was like, oh, and I think this happened on that islands too. All of a sudden they get the green light and it's like, let's make a movie. And uh, that's why the film started so abruptly, like there was no backstory, like Bloomberg was like, let's go. And uh, we were the ones working with uh, Albert at the time. So we, we came into the fold and just started filming again. And then very quickly, we're like, well, let's see what you started filming. And literally, we're just like pulling these boxes of the foot, the original cut work prints and all this stuff from all the other, we had to open up the boxes of all the films. And we started putting together these scenes from all the other, the other films and screening all this stuff to be able to, to pull this st uh, stuff in. It was an enormous amount of footage, but they were talking about it nonstop. So he's working on all these other films. They're always talking about the, the gates. So we were, we could pull from all these things. And in some parts of the project, we were so tempted to like, the story of these two artists is so compelling. Yeah. We should we do a bigger thing in the center? We, we were going to call it like the, the nomads of art. Like these yeah. guys just running around the world, like homeless people building yeah. huge pieces of art. And all the footage was in L studio, like to, to watch and play with. It's very tempting, but we had to keep it down. Once we saw the gates open up, we're like, this is, this is it, Crystal was very animate too. But, did you uh, have a did you have a perspective on his work or his practice as an artist before before you started doing this, or was it something that you sort of came to know in the capacity of you know in your role as the director? Well, I well, to be clear, like me uh, at Maisel's films, it was more like it's a very small group of guys. Yeah. First, it was Albert, Antonio, myself, and we were making a film, and all it, the roles got. Um, arbitrary at some points because we're just yeah. very short staffed and we're just together editing and making films. Um, so we're all directors, but Albert's first four, four or five films, Valley Curtain, Running Fence, uh, The Islands, Pont Neuf, Umbrellas mm -hmm. are also, uh, it's, it's a wonderful study in uh, documentary. Like it's a yeah. documentary film school. So we had studied those films just always like and, and Antonio and I had because we've been working for years but those are ones we always go back to to, to see uh how they put things together they're really um, wonderful films like that that running fence film is so so great it is an extraordinary film it is a really it is a film that is able to capture the kind of experience that you would think you would have to live like you would not imagine that a film could actually faithfully render a project so large and so abstract Mm -hmm. But I do think that it gets really close to that. I do think it feels like, I mean, I wasn't there. It happened like when I was a toddler, right. you know? So, but it, it's as close as we can get now. But as you're saying, it's sort of a remarkable achievement, not just in terms of being a document of an evanescent artwork, but being a sort of an artistic document uh, of, in itself, you know, to being a film in itself. It was a, a fun filmmaking uh era where people were trying to present things more as fiction film and not do all the backstories and not do interviews, not do these things and see if that's what's kind of bringing you in that feeling of being there. A, a lot of these guys from that era would talk about, we're trying to make it feel like you're there and not explain as much, but deliver it like that. Like they made a, they made a, a short film of with Truman Capote after he did in, in Cold Blood, that's wonderful, where he's kind of doing the same thing, like trying to present a documentary thing in a very fiction kind of way. Same, same on compelling. So Matt, what did you feel, what did you think when you actually saw these gates for the first time along with the rest of New York City? 
You know, it you see it grow over. We were filming there for six. I forget how long how long it it, it took, but um, it was a stressful day. I remember uh, that's the first time you saw the billowing f f fabric, and we were with Bristo and enjoying that celebration of finally like the nature was taking. Like before, it was just these rigid gates, and there he all of a sudden he's like, it sounds kind of crazy. It was like, all of a sudden, you can see the wind blowing through the park, and then you could, but then you could see the people just watching the wind, like in mass. <laughs> and you're like, "What's going on here?" And you realize that the gates were a thing, but that's why what that we wanted to capture in the film was to try to show the experience of being there, that I idea of promenading around the park and being out there with all these people. That woman's like, "You got to come down here. It's buzzing. There's all these people here." And the park has always been that way for people. I don't think you transformed the park. You just showed it again like if you're ever there on the first warm day of spring it's like that yeah. park has got an energy and uh yeah. that's what i remember is it really the park was so alive and it was because of those of those gates and also up until that point the park was full of people that didn't they were upset about it yeah but once all the people came that loved it they just they weren't we wouldn't cut them out they just either they didn't come or they were convinced it was kind of interesting but there weren't a lot of people that didn't like them that went to the park those days because the park was yeah, yeah. I love those reaction shots that that happen once the gates get unfurled. Like you, it's really <coughs> rare to see people like enjoying art or like to watch someone else like appreciate something and respond to it. It's right. like going going to the museum with your friend or like eavesdropping on someone else looking at a painting. Like right. you all of a sudden hear someone else is thinking about like, oh, the colors are beautiful. The you know, it makes the space more alive or whatever. That was, I have to credit uh, Antonio Ferrara with that. He went out there a lot and filmed because he wanted to have that intimacy. And if you just if you go out there for a day and you just film a bunch of stuff, you might capture a few of that, but he would just go out there and like walk around. Can I, can I walk with you? And he really yeah. got into people's uh, space. It was good. It was fun to work with. There's a lot of footage. <laughs> <laughs> I especially enjoyed the the film's depiction of the people who were sort of skeptical or doubtful about the import of what was being done. And I think that that was, a, I mean, obviously it feels that that was done with some care, that you were presenting the kind of, the argument about, a larger argument about art. In, in the press conference where Bloomberg, Mayor Bloomberg, mm -hmm. um, is green lighting the project. One of the reporters is saying, um, is this a let them eat cake, yeah. right, moment. That the notion that uh, the city run by a billionaire still kind of healing after 9-11 yeah. is going to spend $20 million. Doesn't matter whose money it is. It's just right. like the sum itself on this experience yeah. by these fancy and therefore suspicious European artists. like. It's funny to see that attitude, how the attitude is sort of consistent from 1979 to 2005, that there's just a skepticism about art and paying for it. Is as it though, worth it? Yeah, is it worth it? And does it matter? You know, he, he says, Christo and Jean-Claude would say, you know, we really don't care what you think of it. But I think what, and I've also heard him like kind of nuance that by saying, I don't care if you like it or not but he expects you to have an opinion. I don't think he expects you to have anything, but he appreciates that you can hate it, but that's a reaction too. And he's more than happy with that. And he would sit and watch that stuff. And the more the guy that wants to bring the flamethrower down and burn them all down, that right. the guy with the beret, he thought that was fantastic. But he wasn't, I don't know. I, he, his, I don't, his whole thing is like, I'm not hurting anything. I'm not anything that I'm, he, well, the, he always believed the park was man-made so I could make it again, which is very true. So what are the people so, um, what are they holding on to? What are they holding on to that, that is so precious? Like, is your dog really going to be upset? Maybe. <laughs> but it, a lot of it is valid too. Like, I think that you to not show all the people being upset. Like, some people just didn't like it. Why, why do you have to put art in my face that I have to, like, now there's forklifts on the park. I don't want it. Um, and to show, like, sometimes art will do that and it's going to displace you and it's going to be in your face and is it is that what the city wants to do and is that a value the city has and if, and if the city has it or, or doesn't and in the late 79s it wasn't a value the city had or not strong enough but yeah. it but that did change like at the the upper level there was no argument we didn't cut that out like bloomberg said go and it went like everyone just gave it the green light like let's let's do this it's gonna be it's remarkable and i wonder i wonder what now 
15 years on what the cultural attitude would be <laughs> to something like this. It's hard for me to extrapolate into because Christo and Jean-Claude were so it's sort of, it, there's nothing comparable, right? Like it's so specific. No, I think there is though. Like I think now there's this whole vocabulary of like public art experiences as like place branding and marketing. Like mm. if this happened in Central Park now, we just call it like the high line of Central Park. Like mm. a new pathway has been charted through public space and it's like beautiful and interesting. Or like the, the Heatherwick vessel Absurdity. Yeah, the vessel, yeah. right, yeah. Like, I, I feel yeah. like we have actually have more language for stuff like this now or more familiarity with it than we did before. And the art world has gotten so much bigger that, like, now if Jeff Koons does something, like, I knew people might have... <laughs> <laughs> but that, like, the, the hand of flowers in, in yeah. Paris or whatever? Yeah. yeah. Like, if he did something, people would be like, oh, this is a visual artist doing, doing something. Uh, right. But I wonder, like, so on that, to that point, Kyle, like, what's different between Jeff Koons, who did install that dog made of flowers, right, <laughs> in Rockefeller Center? Yeah. What's the distinction between what Koons does and what Christo and Jean-Claude were doing, do you think? Well, like, the, I mean, what's so beautiful about the gates is the site specificity of it. Like, it was a piece that existed for a specific place and that, like, really highlighted the landscape and the architecture and like the organization that was already there. Like that, that piece would not be the same in another place. Whereas a public sculpture is just a thing that's plopped down into a plaza. Um, like mm -hmm. to me, it does feel almost more like architecture in the way that you experience it. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it also is like, it's, it's more anonymous in some ways. Like, you can experience it without feeling overwhelmed by the vision of, of an artist, maybe. Like, I think with, I mean, I've like studied minimalism a lot, I guess, so that's all I think <laughs> about. But it's like, minimalism is always about reaffirming your own experience of something, not trying to like force an interpretation on you. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that like the purely visual phenomenon of the gates makes you like think about your own experience of space and light and color. And that's like a more, joyful personal thing than a dog covered with flowers but that's just me <laughs> like the, the dog is good the dog is good well i don't let's not get carried away but <laughs> do you think kyle that the gates i mean part of the reason that i thought you would be so interesting to talk to about this project in particular is that i'm wondering whether the gates sort of as a project aesthetically meets the working definition of minimalism as you understand it or whether it's sort of like embodies those embodies those attributes or you know yeah i think it does i mean in a lot of i think it kind of splits between minimalism and conceptual art a little bit mm -hmm. and like the minimalist <laughs> aspect of this is that it's like an austere visual experience that has like a very small amount of qualities like it's a lot of orange color yeah and you're kind of like experiencing the beauty of orange which which is great um yeah <laughs> Like I always think of this Donald Judd quote that's like, maybe a lot of red is better than two or three colors. <laughs> and this is like a lot of orange. And that's like, to make that, that single gesture is like very minimalist to me. But then how they say the whole process is art and how they use bureaucracy and use like these meetings and negotiations as part of the work, like that makes me think of it as conceptual artwork or like institutional critique almost and that it highlights the yeah. difficulty of doing something like this yeah. in a space like New York. Yeah, the whole thing to me feels a bit like a joke, but I think the only reason the joke succeeds is that the viewer is never the butt of the joke. <laughs> You're welcomed into the joke because you get to you get to understand the joke on power and institution and like the fussy, the fussiness of that people felt about Central Park, like Matt, as you said, echoing what Christo said, it's a man-made space. Like people's attachment to this thing is very silly, actually, in a way. And and the project was so cleverly designed to not interfere, right? So the way the gates themselves were designed was that they were sort of bottom heavy but very safe and they weren't impacting the ground and there was no that they was being put into the ground to hold them up like they were self-sustaining and then you could take them away and it was like it had never happened um i have two questions 
Kyle, I really would like to hear you talk about whether or not you feel like Japan is the touchstone for <laughs> for this project. And and Matt, I'm really curious to know if you know what happened to all of those materials. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, th they're very clear that all the materials have to be recycled. This is what they've always done. They can't be sold as their pieces of art. It has to go into industrial uses and they know when they pick these things out, they'll be shredded and used in they, they find out what, I forget what specifically it was, but the iron was melted down. You couldn't buy one of those weights. He's very specific about it. And I think those vinyl gates themselves, I think they're shredded too. And they're used for fencing, but they're orange. I doubt they're used for fences anywhere. I think they're probably shredded as well with the, the fabric. They're all just, they, they find other uses in the industrial world. So nothing is thrown out pretty much. He finds his design is pretty specific to, to be able to use everything they buy Got it. In, in recycling. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. As far as the Japan thing, it's like, it's such an interesting question because I was, you know, looking up more information about the gates and like seeing what's on the Wikipedia page. <laughs> and a lot of things reference the Fushimi Inari temple in Kyoto, which is like the famous Instagram friendly like series of orange gates that proceeds yeah. up the, the mountain that the temple is on. Um, and like visually, actually, I didn't see the gates, uh, which was dumb of me, but um, <laughs> the, like walking up the, that temple hill, the visual experience is really of just like an intense field of orange that you're like walking through this tunnel of, of orange. And it doesn't have the kind of fluttering fabric, but I guess like they, they clearly have this thing in common, this like visual quality and this like intensity of space and light. Um, but then <laughs> so often minimalism or like artists in general don't like to cite their influences. <laughs> like they don't want to be like, oh, I saw these orange yeah. gates and I yeah. thought it would be cool. They want to be like, no, I've created this idea for yeah. nothing and I will execute it uh, in my own vision. Um, exactly. So I'm really curious if if Christo ever formally, or Christo and Jean-Claude ever formally cited that, or if it was just like a visual reference that people- I'm trying to remember now, because the question's been asked many times about the, the color and uh, these references. And I remember them feeling of a being, you know, when they started out, it was going to be pipes with like a curtain. It was much different. And that maybe not so much, like I think it evolved in these things, but I think he, he never, gave it up to oh yeah i got it from this thing ever like, he evolved this idea <laughs> over 30 years and tried out a bunch of stuff he's really believed the right color to see a stream of saffron all across center park was that color it wouldn't have been blue or they tried gold they tried all kinds of colors but this is the he's like that's just the right color is my vision yeah i'm so curious if it happened again today like would would it be an issue that there seemed to be this like very close visual reference point in these kind of religious gates. Uh, and like, so to leave it unsighted is kind of, is interesting. Like I totally, I totally agree that like art, art can come from nothing and maybe that was not a reference point, but I like as a viewer, you definitely make the connection. And I think it, it makes it more valuable and like more interesting to connect these two totally disparate things that people have, have created. Sure, I remember him acknowledging it, but I don't. I don't want to speak for him. I don't remember his exact yeah. response. He definitely, uh, it's something that came out of his head. Yeah, <laughs> which I think connects again to the way that I think of them as being sort of tricksters, like good faith, <laughs> good natured tricksters, but like that they're that they're having fun, that they know Absolutely. what they're doing, yeah. and that there's and that it's. Uh, provocation. There's a lot of provocation in it, even in that color, where the colors, because they use that pink around the islands, yeah. um, the colors to which they were drawn on these big scale projects, like the Mastaba in London, are really strange. And they're very, very, they're, they're not, they don't, they neither like, I don't know, it's hard to explain what the relationship is between their color and nature it's like it's very uh it, they don't fit comfortably comfortably together but they're not so opposite that it's like oh clearly you're just doing this it, you're intervening in nature via color it's some other thing is happening some other dynamic is happening 
And it feels to me like there is reference in art history because I, I just assume, like artists know art history, like that's the land that they're steeped in. And I think that there's just a reluctance on the part of the artist to get into it. Like they don't want us to know what they're talking about. <laughs> oh, he wants you to come up with your own stuff, sure. Um, he also, he spends so much time just alone in his studio, alone with photographs and and he's working through colors and things like that. I'm sure he's referencing all the things you're saying too. It's highly trained, but um, uh, he, he's coming up with the right, like the umbrellas were blue and gold, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. Which was pretty striking for those places. Like, <clears throat> yeah. Um, Kyle, somebody asked this question in the chat, and it's a question that I had, and I wonder if you had too watching this film is, what the experience of this work would be in a post iPhone era. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's like, well, this is, it does strike me that it looks like an Instagram trap or like these are aesthetics that we now associate with Instagram ability. And like, yeah. there would be a hashtag, there would absolutely yeah. be like hashtag the gates. Um, and people would take selfies and like Tinder bio photos yeah. underneath the gates and it would become this <laughs> And yeah. I think like, I don't know, it's, I love all that stuff. And I think it just shows how much more visual culture has become. Mm -hmm. And like more people are more fluent in how color works in a landscape and like mm -hmm. what makes an interesting image. And sure. like, we just, we play with that stuff so much more. And I, I don't know, I think that'd be very cool because you would see this huge feed of like every view of the gates that could ever have existed. And you would capture every kind of weather and every kind of light. Um, but certainly there would be the like, you know, New York Magazine hot take that's like, <laughs> you know, the Gates is just a stupid Instagram trap. Like we should, we should have spent this money elsewhere or something. Like the same problems would come up once again. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's funny to hear you talk about um, the mitigating influence of the technology or the social media platform actually has educated people about how things look or to think more deeply maybe about, even if they're just thinking about how they look in relation to the thing, like how to capture the essence of the thing on screen or how to depict themselves in relation to the thing, the eye has been sharpened. And one of the, one of the moments I love the most in this documentary, The Gates, is there's a gentleman in the park, a uh, kind of older guy who, is talking to Christo and is saying like, I know this park, I know this park so well, and this looks amazing. This is a gift. <laughs> he, I forget the word he uses, um, it's but he- soul. It's a gift for the soul. Is that that yes, kind of yes. And he, said, he ends up saying something that maybe is not exactly what you expect when the conversation begins. Right. And, and, his, and his understanding of the project seems to mean something to the artist. Like it seems like Christo and Jean-Claude are genuinely tickled that this man is having so large a reaction and so like generous and warm a reaction. And it really belies the idea raised by this reporter in the press conference that like, oh, this is like a let them eat cake thing. This is a thing for like millionaire collectors who's, who live over Central Park to open their windows and they like, look down at it and be like, oh, how pretty, you know? And this is just like some average New Yorker being like, this is amazing. This is so beautiful. And in some ways, I, I understand the critique of Instagram, especially as it relates to tourism, that it sort of cheapens people's, it reduces people's experience of space to a purely visual one or to, to, to like, it's calculated just to get the right kind of photograph. But I think you can also see that this person is really having a moving experience of art and is maybe not the kind of person you expect to have that experience of art. He's having it for free in the in neighborhood park, you know? That also took place on the northwest side of the park up in Harlem. And that's back in the early days, <coughs> they didn't expect Harlem to be the hard part of the project. They thought it'd all be the south part of the park the more affluent part of the park that would be so suspicious, but the all the city boards in Harlem, th they got a lot of pushback of like, we don't need this, we need something else. If yeah. you have money to spend, come bring it here. So I think that was part of why he was so like, oh, here we are in Harlem and someone from Harlem, like, got it. Thank yeah. you. 
think that some of that was carried over from uh, uh, from that era. Yeah. I also love the final shot in the, or <laughs> is it the final shot? But it's he, you're talking to the, he's like a hot dog vendor. A hot dog vendor. Yeah. And he's like, yeah, this is the gates are pretty cool, but like really, I like the umbrellas more. And like that's the <laughs> that's the art connoisseur mindset. Like uh, his, his earlier work was like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like this is this is too cliche. I don't like it. <laughs> that was kind of the love the love letter to New York. Like even the, the, the vendor, even the hot dog vendor knows all about his history. Yeah, yeah. It's so good. Matt, I wonder if uh, you have a perspective on the particular relationship or dynamic between Jean Claude and Christo as mm -hmm. spouses, as collaborators. Um, Christo's earlier works are not always attributed to both of them, but the later work is usually attributed to both of them as a team. She says at one point in, in the film, and again, it, it has this feel of like rehearsed stump speech patter where she says like, well, I became an artist because Krista was an artist. And if he had been a dentist, I would be a dentist. Like that, that there's this sort of this great love affair, but they've also been sort of consumed by a shared devotion to this sort of one particular calling. Mm -hmm. Did that look more complex to you up front, Or what did that look like to you up front? Uh, I don't know how long they'd been together by that time, but they were so together and some of their things some of their responses sound can because they're constantly selling they're wherever they're going they would they would tell us like we don't go on vacation if we're going to go somewhere we're going to go explore a site to do another show to do another project like we're always together <coughs> has, she would jean claude would tell us like christo does what he does and i do what i do and we we mesh one day she told me like christo is the artist and he needs sometimes you need a monster the artist can't be that guy. And she depicted herself like that. These, these were her words. I thought it was very, because she comes across as very aggressive. And I, I was with her one day in the park and some morning TV show was trying to film them. And she wanted the field producer to agree that they'd only be shot in a two shot. That, you know, they weren't, they thought that they were just going to try to give the credit to Christo because he was the artist and who was this John, John Claude. And uh, it got really heated. And the field producer who was, the field producer said, I can't guarantee that. And she, John Claude looks around the park at all the stuff that they did. She goes, I did all this? Like, what can, what can you do? And they, they've worked it out, but it was genuine. And it was, they were really in love. They were always sitting next to each other and close to each other and whispering to each other, elbowing. And um, they were enjoying the same life. It was so, I just, so unified. It was uh, really impressive. They were such a force of nature. It really complicates some of the ways that we like to talk about, like, um, especially like an outsized artist, somebody who works on a scale at which these artists were operating, that can feel like we expect that, uh, we, we associate that with sort of a masculine impulse, right? Like to conquer landscape or to do something so big and grand. And then it's, complica it, it's a complicating factor to have his partner be a woman and also his romantic partner. And so yeah. then is she sort of being like the producer or like the bad cop and running interference? And is that part of the aesthetic statement? And it seems very clear from the way they talk about their work that they think it was, that they think it was Absolutely. a product of two minds working in concert, you know? Because they have the, you know, that what they would call the software period of the art, the hardware, the software is all the negotiation and perhaps the selling. Um, and if that is part of the art, the whole thing is part of the art. Well, Jean-Claude is such a part of, of, of that stuff. She doesn't have the pen in her hand because she wasn't trained to do that. These are things that she, I'm hearing the, the dog and pony show that they would say too often. She, she would explain it this, this way. Like, he does that, he's trained for that. I have my, my skill set, but they could only make the art in the park if she sold it. And she was such a good salesperson and she could walk into meetings with a certain, she knew when to pipe up and when to, um, get involved. So do you have a sense So Jean-Claude died a couple of years ago and Christo died earlier this year. Mm -hmm. Do you have a sense of what will become of their practice and their unrealized projects? And, you know, where all of that, like what happens if they are conceptual artists, does the concept outlive them? Is the concept concluded? Is the work done? Do you know any of that? Do you have a sense of any of that? I don't know, you know, the third, they might have more, but like ever since um, Umbrellas, 
Christo's nephew, Vladimir, has been with them, and he's been like another character, and he's been um, helping them, but he's also very involved with uh, the films and things, and they've archived everything. I'm sure it's completely archived and taken care of. Uh, and Ar is the Arc de Triumph, is that still happening? I don't know. I don't, I'm off track yeah. of that. I think there was, they might still go ahead. Yeah. I'm not sure. Don't quote me. I, it was yeah. hard to what I read the other day. I lost, lost track of that. But I don't know. You know, they have a, a house that is on Hester Street that could, I have no idea what, what, what they're going to do, but yeah. everything's there, you know? Yeah. I mean, Kyle, I'm curious because you think about art and you write about art so much, and I wonder what you think about, like, what happens to these big grand expressions when they vanish? I mean, I know you've like, like, what happens? Like, what do we do? Like, what's the artifact? Like, what's the, what's the way of engaging with the projects that Christo and Jean-Claude undertook after, I mean, they are gone now, but also the projects are gone. So how does yeah. it enter art history? How does it enter, you know, hmm. our cultural, you know, how does it become a cultural yeah. legacy? I mean, this is the great, like one of the innovations of that kind of ephemeral work is that it resists this kind of like commodification and canonization. Yeah. Like it can't, <laughs> it can't be so easily incorporated into like the, the narrative of art history. But then like having the document, the documentary, the footage and like the, this kind of inside look into all of it, like that to me is, it's like the record of the thing. It's the the artifacts and the kind of metadata of the of, of the work of art itself, though the work of art is gone. And that's, yeah. I mean, we're so familiar with that. Like the pyramids don't look like they did before. Or like, right. you know, we still like ruins or, and it, it also makes me think of so much contemporary art that's like not really meant to last. Like Anselm Kiefer, the painter, yeah. legendarily attached like hay to his, work and it starts falling off and like conservators yeah. have to start gluing the hay back on or deciding <laughs> how to let it decay and I think I mean the ephemerality is part of what makes these things more poignant and more beautiful and as long as like it is really great that we have these media artifacts because we can get a sense of what it was like um, even if we can't experience the thing itself. It's, like, it's yeah. interesting they, they also I mean, they publish those giant books that are yeah. photographs at every meeting and every they mm -hmm. every thing that was made. They document everything. It's they're like such documents. Like it will not be forgotten. It, the stuff exists. It, it'll if you wanted to find it, it's it's all there. Every step of the way, every part of their work is there. And the photographs and the film are just on top of that. And they <laughs> they, they restored them and or restore them, but archive them the, at the highest quality throughout. And they made sure that they were. Uh, going to be around for a long time. Which again, I think goes back to my sense of their own, their, their consciousness of what they were doing, right? That even if the temporary nature of the installation itself was a part of the thing, they knew that they were working for posterity. They were, they were documenting it all along the way. And the film provides that particular document, right? And in exactly the same way that Louis Mel and then Jonathan Demi provide that document of um, Andre Gregory's work, like performance that is meant to exist only for the sake of performance, but then a filmmaker can come in and just capture it just so that it's there, just so, just to cover the bases. And so it's funny because it sort of belies the rigor, the intellectual rigor of like, oh no, I'm just doing this, this temporary thing and it will not exist anymore, except for I'm going to have a world-class filmmaker make a film of it and make sure that it'll always exist. Uh, I think part of it is too, that it's, uh, it's around for two weeks so then you take it away. So it's like the fact that, well, why would you get that upset? It's only there for two weeks, but I get to do this. I get to make this beautiful thing I always wanted to do. I never said I didn't care about it. I said, I wanted to do it. So I, I don't ever want to forget it. I just, it has to go away, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And then I can meet people that say, oh, I wish I was there. <laughs> see that? Come next time. Do you feel like, Matt, when you were there shooting, do you feel like you got to see it as a person or do you feel like when you're working behind a camera or with a camera, you're just engaged in sort of the work of being the filmmaker there? Well, so much of this, when the gates were open, there's this different kind of documentary filmmaking where it's, it's landscape at some points and it's filming people and 
we'd send a lot of cinematographers out there to film stuff. And it, it was just like, how do you fill these lines of gates to find shots? And you, you kind of evolve over the time. You find, you're like looking at the art for a long period of time and trying to <coughs> definitely, you're always looking at it as a filmmaker, but you're appreciating it from all different perspectives. And how can you make this cinematic and how can you do something with it? So I totally enjoyed the project because I got to hang out in Central Park for so long. Yeah. Well, it's winter. It's like Even in the dead of winter. Yeah. 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 Kyle, I tried to think of an answer to this question for so long and I just could not think of one. Is there a contemporary artist engaged in a kind, uh, in a practice that approaches what these guys were up to? Like, can you think of any work, contemporary work that is analogous to the particular weird specifics of what these two were doing? It's a good question. I mean, the, the thing that it reminds me the most of, and I'm unfortunately blanking <clears throat> on the name of the artist, but it was this like, it was a kind of conceptual or like institutional critique work where these artists basically like recovered a brownfield, like a piece of land that was totally ruined by the environment, like environmentally ruined. And the project was to like return it to health, return mm -hmm. this like one area to health. And that I think it reminds me of this because it's it's both ephemeral and enduring. Like it's a gesture that takes place in a space and like isn't around forever, but its effects continue and it like lingers as a kind of poetic statement. Um, yeah, I think like thematically, I don't know, this, this artist Spencer Finch, who I really love, um, does these kind of associative colorful works where he tries to like mimic the conditions of light in a specific place at a specific time. Or he did this one project where he made soft serve ice cream in the colors of the sunset over St. Louis. And there was just one day where there was an ice cream truck handing out soft serve in like beautiful pink and blue and yellow shades. And that to me is just like one of my favorite artworks ever and reminds me. <laughs> Yeah. Like the ephemeral, it's art is a moment of beauty and that's all it has to be at some yeah. points. And the gates really makes me think of that. But the, the scale of it is so massive that I don't, few artists can work on that scale, except like like the Jeff Koons and Damien Hirst yeah. of the world make yeah. kitschy garbage yeah. instead of yeah. like <laughs> large environmental gestures. <laughs> Yeah, they're, they're also in a sort of factory setting, right? Um, what we're seeing essentially is like a factory. But mm -hmm. to me, Christo, just as a name, just occupies a place in the, in the larger imagination, even a not a, like, you don't have to know anything about art history to have a sense of who Christo was. Like, you know, I mean, if you have been a joke, on the Simpsons, that's sort of like a measure <laughs> of a kind of cultural relevance or like, and that is sort of what I think Christo occupied. And I, I suppose Jeff Koons is the contemporary artist who comes closest to that right now, but there's just a, I know that he, I take him at his word that they were not doing this as a gesture. They were not doing this as a gift to people, but I cannot help but see it that way, especially having seen the work in person. I understand it was this tremendous exercise of monstrous ego that if you are a one named artist who is being joked about on The Simpsons, you're going to, you're going to be working with that kind of ego that's gonna be part of your raw material. But there, there, was, there was something really specific and strange and magical and lovely that they did that that even if it was just for them, they let other people into it. Like you could enter into it sort of physically and literally, and you could get your own thing out of it. And that strikes me as very rare and kind of selfless, even though Chris and Jean Club would probably yell at me for saying that. You, you can compare <laughs> it to like the Kusama boom, kind of. Like, yeah. Yeah, yeah yes. Kusama is such a different. <laughs> yes artist but inspires a kind of fervor for the infinity rooms and like they become de facto public works even yeah. though they're totally not public works like i i don't know that many public works that she's done um but she is like i feel like she's the archetypal or the stereotypical artist figure of the moment where it's like that's interesting and she has this yeah. these cliches of like oh she lives in a in a like mental hospital yeah. and yeah 
has this mythical mm -hmm. life and narrative around her, but the work does not have that same public quality or like the same feeling of being a gift to anyone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I suppose Christo and Jean-Claude are sort of like, you know, they're gone now and say so they were sort of the last of their generation living out a different kind of archetype, which was the Soho Bohemian who had just hung in there. I mean, uh, one of my good friends was, is, is a restaurateur and he worked at the French, he was a student and then worked at the French Culinary Institute uh, in Soho and Christo and Jean-Claude ate dinner there every night, bizarrely. <laughs> and so you... And you could see them and they just looked absolutely extraordinary with her like incredible red hair and his sort of befuddled Eastern European performance. And you just, you saw them and you were like, these are the people <laughs> who are still here in Soho yeah. in some, probably in some dump that they paid a hundred dollars for that is now <laughs> like the most expensive real estate in New York City. They were just the last gasp of that particular archetype and it's so it's so sad to me to see that go it was I was genuinely saddened when I heard of Christos death earlier this year I just think yeah. he was yeah. an extraordinary artist I know he again I know he wasn't giving us a gift but I feel like I got a gift out of it <laughs> like and not just in the gates but in all the other work that I never got to see in person just knowing that it was out there is really remarkable you know and so the Gates, the film that we are talking about, I think, I feel like is similarly a gift. And so Matt, I am so grateful that you were here to talk to us about it. And I'm so glad that the film exists. And I really like, it's really, it captures something that I was lucky enough to see in person, but everyone who hasn't seen this film really should, because it just, especially right now, I said to you guys before, like I've really been missing going to an art museum and watching this film was like, it's like when you really want a coffee and then you take like a like a double shot of espresso, like it sort of over delivers, like this film like oh, over delivered. Oh, I was really missing art and then I watched this film and I was like, oh, this is what I'm missing, you know? Did we lose yeah, Matt? <laughs> well, we're out of time anyway, but this was so much fun. Kyle, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you. It, it looks great. like we lost Matt, but I am so glad that he was able to be here tonight. And anyone who hasn't watched this film, it's called The Gates. It's available now. I highly recommend it. And thank you everybody for joining us again for the last of our summer film festival. <laughs> Thanks guys. Thank you. Bye.